This is a map of the Roman Empire. When you look at the general image, you see an empire hugging the Mediterranean, expanding north from it to protect its provinces on it. When you look at this map, one thing seems off. Why the hell do the Romans control this island? Why would the Romans conquer a small island which had almost no value? Why would a land civilization that could barely navigate the Atlantic ever want to conquer an island on the edges of the earth? So why did the Romans invade Britain? The main reason was political. Emperor Claudius recently became emperor and was widely considered to be a simpleton, so to solidify his power he wanted a conquest. With Germania and Persia too hard, he decided on Britain for this purpose. There were some minor reasons like tin supply, but the Roman Empire had little need for tin in an age of iron. The conquest of Britain took place over the next few decades, reaching its climax at the Antonine Wall in the center of Scotland around 110 AD. To start this timeline, the Romans simply decide not to invade Britain. They had little reason to do so, and it's as simple as they decide not to. If Claudius didn't do it, no one else would likely do so, partially for the reason above, but also because the amount of time when the Roman Empire had the energy and leadership to make conquest was running out. Before I start this alternate history, I want to briefly talk about the internal dynamic of the British Isles before the Roman Empire. The entire Isles were united by a common Celtic culture, but from what we can piece together, there were several main Celtic subcultures within this. The islands were divided between many different small local chiefdoms, with each region having its own chiefdom. Starting in the north, there were the Savage North primitive Pictish tribes. Most of the rest of the main island of Great Britain were inhabited by Britons or the ancestors of the modern-day Welsh of our timeline, speaking an ancestor language. The southeast were settled by the Belgae tribes, recent immigrants from the continent or what would become Belgium. They had more contact with the Roman Empire and were more advanced, even starting to build what were on the roads to cities. And also, Ireland had its own separate culture which had a loose connection to that of the Scottish Highlands. Without the Romans, we would still have seen Roman influence in the islands. The Roman Empire was the United States of its age, an economic giant that sucked everything into its orbit. This meant that Roman trade spread far outside its borders. Roman wine was sold in great number among the horse tribes of Ukraine. The Irish loved Roman jewelry, and the Germans loved Roman glass. We would see this process in the British Isles, with British chieftains trading their goods for Roman ones, thus introducing Roman culture. This process was actually happening even before the Romans invaded in our timeline, reaching the point in which some some British chieftains were actually vassals of Rome, and Southampton was developing into a major port for trade with the continent. This would in turn have resulted in political change as well. The British chieftains would take Roman wine, but also with it see how the Roman army functioned, or how Roman ideas of kingship and central unity worked. This was actually a process that took place elsewhere on the edges of the Roman Empire, notably Germania. The Germanic tribes advanced greatly with the background of the Roman Empire. The Germanic tribes grew in number and unity to the point of basically becoming kingdoms in their own right. Very similar processes would have happened in this timeline in England, with the southeast being closest to the continent benefiting the most from this process. This is exactly what happened to Korea and Japan in our timeline in the same time period. Neither nation was conquered by China, but both were nearby and sucked into China's orbit. Thus, they adopted Chinese culture and advanced with Chinese precedents. Unification and nationhood tend to develop with urbanization, since the authority needed to get all the supplies for a city and run the sheer amount of people in it requires a strong central authority, which can easily translate into unified nations and kingship. Thus, as trade would expand in southeastern England with the Roman Empire, we should expect kingdoms to develop in southeastern England in the few centuries after Christ. It's hard to predict details because so much of history in this time period is made by battles and minor chiefs, which makes predicting the outcome especially hard. This is a period in which modern Europe was still being made and thus in flux. For example, if a minor battle went differently, France would be controlled by the Visigoths and thus in a union with Spain, or if the Ostrogoths lost a certain battle, Italy would be speaking Greek today. This makes predicting this era in alternate history really hard, because small differences make a big change. However, I'm going to guess that a united South English Celtic state would develop between the 2nd and 6th centuries, in the same way Ethiopia, Japan, Korea, the Germanic tribes, and others developed in the shadows of larger empires in this era. Over the next couple hundred years, this South English kingdom, using its advancement and unity, would likely expand across the rest of England, pushing north and west, likely taking the fertile south and center of the country. In our timeline, when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, Britain did with it. While the Saxons were pagans, the Welsh kept Christianity and passed it on to the Irish, who in turn passed it on to the Scots and most of the Saxons. In this timeline, the Isles would still convert to Christianity for a couple of reasons, being that Axial Age religions always crush pre-Axial Age religions, and Christianity would connect the Isles with the continent, and Christianity gave kings divine right, which allowed them to solidify their kingships. 
In our timeline, the Irish created their own church called the Celtic Church that had its own practices. This church converted Scotland to the north of England, but in the end was incorporated to general Catholicism by a combination of compromise and conquest. The same thing would happen in this timeline, similarly to how the separate Mozarab Spanish church was incorporated into Catholicism in the same era. However, likely converting the entire British Isles would mean that the Celtic Church would have more local negotiating clout, and thus would likely have more autonomy and local customs that would survive. In our timeline, the Romans kept three legions and many garrisons in the relatively useless province of Britain. And in this timeline, these troops would be redeployed across the empire to more useful frontiers like the Rhine or the Danube. However, the Roman Empire mainly collapsed for internal reasons, meaning that without Britain, the empire would still have collapsed just a couple years later. The Saxon raids would still take place over Britain, since the collapse of Roman authority in the region would leave the shores of the area open for piracy, and the Saxons already raiding northern France would just cross the channel to England. The Saxons were really amazing warriors, and so we should still expect them to conquer parts of eastern England in this timeline. However, in the end, the Saxons would likely assimilate into Celtic culture instead of having Germanic culture become dominant across the Isles. This is for a couple of reasons. Firstly, with the Roman army pulling out of Britain, it left no strong military force to resist the Saxons, since it had been 200 years since the British had had independence and were practically defenseless against the Saxons without the Romans. This meant the Saxons were able to seize the wealthiest eastern third of Britain in a mere 20 years. However, in this timeline, the British would have had their own warriors who would have had generations of experience fighting each other, and there would not be the sheer chaos of pulling out of the Roman legions and the power vacuum that followed. Secondly, in our timeline, the Romano-British culture was confined to the cities that were Roman while the countryside was Celtic. This meant that there was no united cultural front to resist the Saxons, and no strong central Romano-British culture to stand behind. This meant that the Britons that were stuck behind Saxon lines were assimilated into Saxon culture. In this timeline, however, there would be a strong united culture for Britons to fall back on. This was actually seen as a process that took place in many of the Celtic nations that had Germanic invaders. Ireland assimilated the Vikings and Normans, Scotland assimilated the Vikings, Anglo Saxons and Normans. The Saxons were not the only invaders of England in this time period. The Picts hammered down from the north across the Wall, and the Irish conquered parts of Wales and Cornwall, while raiding the coast of Britain. The Franks also did some irrelevant raids in the southeast and only talking out to show off. The Irish would still be beaten in the west, but without the Saxons who defeated the Picts, we should expect the Picts to conquer part of northern England. However, through this gauntlet of fire, the South English Kingdom, or some successor state, would likely survive and even press further out to the north and west, either destroying or assimilating the invaders. Again, this is a part of history that's really hard to predict in alternate history, and so I can't give details well, but I'm going to gander a few long-term trends. The Vikings are still going to raid the British Isles, but just like the Saxons before them, and the Vikings in Ireland and Scotland, they're going to assimilate into the local Celtic culture. We would see the general long-term trend of the South English Kingdom using its strength and unity to spread across the Isles. I don't know if Ireland and Scotland would be independent, but I expect the South British Kingdom to become dominant simply due to its beneficial geography. The Normans are simply too dependent upon the events of our timeline to exist in this world. To have the Norman conquest of England, you need to have the Viking Kingdom of York fail, and that raid on Wessex to fail as well, thus releasing Vikings for France. After that, you need the amazing leaders to keep and seize Normandy, keep Norman independence, defeat the Bretons, conquer England, and just plenty of dumb luck that allowed the Norman conquest of England. The butterfly effect would make this impossible. Britain in general would not have had an important foreign invasion for 2,500 years in this timeline, and so it would have evolved in a very different direction from the rest of Europe. Modern English culture is connected to both France, Germany, and Scandinavia by hundreds of years of cultural and political conquest that simply would have never happened in this timeline. This is similar to Japan in our timeline, who received culture from China, yet was never invaded. Thus, Japanese culture is one of a kind and very different from any other nation on Earth. This makes it hard to predict. Britain of this timeline could either ignore petty continental politics and build an amazing colonial empire, or it could simply turn in on itself and never achieve anything. In general, you'd have less English interference in continental politics. This would likely result in France uniting earlier and Spain conquering Portugal. But again, the butterfly effect makes this hard to predict. What a feltist, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please comment or subscribe, and please stay tuned for my next video. Thank you.